Hi, everybody. I want to talk a little bit today about how I met today's guest, Craig Swenson. I don't usually talk about myself on this show, but I think the story is very relevant. In the early days of my career, I worked at a small marketing team at this little company called Salesforce. Now, this was before Salesforce was the giant that they are today, with skyscrapers with their names all over it. This is before every brand had a Facebook ad strategy. This was a different time. And we were a team of precocious marketers with a lot of attitude and the tenacity to do whatever it takes to figure things out. We were the rebels. Led by our fearless leader, Craig Swenson, we were a key part of turning Salesforce from a successful but still scrappy startup to the industry veteran that it is today. Of course, all good things must come to an end, and our team didn't stay together forever, but the success didn't stop with Salesforce. Many members of that tiny rebellious marketing team are now CMOs at many of the most successful SaaS companies in the world, including Twilio, Zwara, Qualified, and of course, Talent. Part of the reason that so many of the members of that team were so successful is because of the mentorship of Craig. It isn't because he taught us everything about digital marketing. Honestly, with digital marketing, we were just figuring it out along the way. But it's because Craig taught us so much about decision making. And that's the thing I'd say about making great decisions. It's not enough to learn about it from a book. You need to really have a great mentor who can model what great decision making looks like for you. And I was lucky enough to have that back at Salesforce with Craig. So wherever you are in your career, look for those people who are great leaders who can show you the ropes and squeeze every ounce of knowledge from them that you can. So without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome to Truth Be Known. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Craig. I am so excited to have you on Truth Be Known. Uh, you and I have known each other for a really long time at this point. Uh, I like to think I'm not old enough to have known you for 12 or 13 years, uh, but great to have you on the show. Tell us about Tell everyone a little bit about you. Hey, Lauren. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for having me on the show. My name is Craig Swensrud. I'm uh, the, the co-founder and CEO of a company called qualified.com. We're a conversational marketing platform that's kind of purpose built for Salesforce. And uh, we're based here in San Francisco. So let's get right into it. I I know some of these things, but I don't know all of these things. So I think this will be really fun for me too. How did you get started in tech? Well, work? my journey into tech started way, way back way back. I was I was super, super lucky uh, to have grown up and have gone to grown up in San Diego, California, by the way, and have gone to an elementary school that had a computer in the classroom. And of course, I'm dating myself a little bit, but it was like, whoa, there's a computer in this classroom and there, there weren't computers in everybody's classrooms, you know, back then. And uh, and I was also lucky enough to attend a junior high school and there was a computer programming class at my junior high school. And, um, and so I just kind of took to it. I, I really in, enjoyed computers. I really enjoyed programming and then, and then sort of the stars aligned because I happened to go to college at UC Berkeley. And for those of you who are listening to the show, uh, who are unaware of where Berkeley is, it's right across the bridge from, uh, from San Francisco. It's kind of in the heart of, uh, of, of what became Silicon Valley. And so when I graduated from college, I was basically kind of immersed in, in the tech industry in trying to find a new, you know, a job and pay the bills. The tech industry was where the opportunity was. And so I was personally passionate about it. I kind of had some skills in it. I had an engineering degree from Berkeley and there were these companies that were hiring. And so I took a job. My first job was at Oracle, a big enterprise software company, and I was doing data entry. So the, the fabulous job of taking paper off of fax machines and punching it into uh, punching it into computers. That wasn't the best job, but I found my way into lots of jobs. I was, I was super happy about uh, sales, sales engineering, uh, product marketing, technical marketing, uh, and kind of everything on the go-to-market side and product side of a tech company. And uh, I couldn't be happier. Awesome. And how did you go from data entry to sales engineering and product marketing? Well, the funny thing was I was the guy who entered the orders 
into the computer. So the sales guys would bring me their orders on pieces of paper when they would close a deal. And I would kind of punch it into back then what was like the most rudimentary CRM application on the planet. And so I had, you know, I, I had, I had sales, sales folks coming over to my desk and kind of, I was learning about sales. I was learning about take, taking orders. I was understanding what their world was, but I kind of had this like technical bent. I didn't really want to be a sales sales guy, yeah. but I wanted to be involved in deals. And so I had the technical background and I was like, what is this sales engineering job? It's like, you're kind of selling, but you're also kind of explaining and positioning technology. And so, you know, those guys worked on the floor above me and I was just like, let me move up one floor right? <laughs> and, and, and into something more exciting. That's awesome. It's um, it's funny. I, I think I've told you this story once before, and it reminds me a little bit of this. And this is my for the people that are listening, the the story about why, in so many ways, I owe Craig my career, and I like to embarrass him as much as I can. That it's I like how you started out. You're doing data entry. You're kind of digging in and learning things. Going, I bet you I could do this. I'm going to try this sales engineering thing. I get this. That years and years ago. Um, I was working in sales and for anyone who knows me, I'm the worst closer in the world. I should never work in sales. It's not what I do. Um, and, but I'm working in sales and I also sort of had a marketing background and I'd done paid search and this is a million years ago before anyone did paid search. So I'm helping out the marketing team. And I had this weird realization that not all leads are the same. And because I was picking up the phone and I was calling leads that came in and I went, these leads over here, they turn into money for me and I'm making commission off of this. And these leads aren't doing anything. And at this time, it is early, early days of Salesforce. You don't really have lead scoring. You don't have data. But I've got this basic understanding that one type of lead is different from the other type of lead. And I'm running these paid search campaigns for the same company. And I started to, to look into, I started to look and say, I bet some of these are different. And I did a bunch of Google searches and tried to figure out what if I can connect how, uh, what if I can connect Google AdWords to Salesforce? What if there's a way that I can figure out what keyword I'm advertising on is driving the type of lead that's converting into deals? And then, because I was a very smart salesperson, it's like, what if I can build myself a lead list? <laughs> that then has all of the leads that come from the keywords that convert to deals. And those are my lead lists. And I ended up finding Keaton, which was the company that, uh, one of the many companies Craig has founded. And that turned into how I started building my own lead list, how I figured out this is how I can pick quota with doing less. And then by the way, I really like this marketing thing. So now I can spend more time on marketing because I really enjoy marketing and I really enjoy digital and online marketing. And then for years, I remember speaking at search conferences about the importance of tying, importance of tying your data together, the importance of looking at the right metrics and saying, you absolutely have to tie your paid search campaigns to, <laughs> to Salesforce. And this is how you're going to run your business. This is going to completely change all of your ROI this will revolutionize how you run your business. And then six years later, I end up working for Craig and got to slightly nerd out in the back of my head going, I think I bought his product. And that was the thing I was talking about for years because he and one of, one of the companies that he founded completely changed how marketers should look at data, how B2B marketers should care about data, what our metrics should be. So it is one of my, my favorite Craig stories before I even met Craig. Well, it's funny. It's funny you bring that up, Lauren, because um, when we when we found in Keaton and just kind of like a transition from 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 my background, I started out in enterprise technology, worked for a lot of big companies like Oracle and 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 SAP, and traveled around the world and 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 sold software. W went went to work for a, a smaller company, a startup in San Francisco that that that, that went out of business, and um, had this idea. Uh, with my co-founder, Sean Whiteley, for what became Salesforce for Google AdWords. The initial idea was, hey, why don't we create an app on Salesforce that lets marketers buy ads on Google? And we thought that was going to be like the magic sauce. And the, the funny thing was, we only had to roll it out to like 10 customers, and they all said, nope, that's not the magic sauce. The magic sauce is connecting the data, right? Connecting mm -hmm. the click 
and the keyword and the campaign and the ad group, connecting that to what's in Salesforce, which is the lead, the contact, the opportunity, and the account. And if you can tie the click to the revenue, that's when you can learn, you know, where to spend your money. And with, with the rise of online advertising and Google AdWords specifically, you know, marketers are dumping tons of cash into the Google AdWords machine and hoping it produces results. But for B2B companies, you have no idea unless you can tie the mm -hmm. data together. It, it, it's so true. And I remember back when I was doing this and I was on the other side and the things you think back on or the things I think back on is I, at the time, was the eight, I was running paid advertising and we were the eighth largest online advertiser for Google. And I was grossly unqualified to be spending that much money, but I ended up running this. And I remember things like from what Craig had built and being able to tie this data together, I would look at different keywords and I would spend three or $400,000 a month on two different keywords and everything would look great. And one keyword was driving 10 times as many leads. And then as soon as I connected clicks to revenue, the keyword that was driving a ton of leads turns out was not driving any money in revenue. The one that had expensive leads actually produced the most revenue. Hustler Lauren then prioritized those leads for her sales job. But for the rest of the company, I ended up cutting hundreds of thousand dollars in spend, reallocating that money, driving more revenue because so much of it was that what see, now is a seemingly simple concept of connecting clicks to revenue, tying all of that data into one place. And that is the birth of a massive industry around this. It's uh, exciting to see what we've all <laughs> done as marketers over the last 20 years. None of this stuff was around not that long ago. And now it's, it's what we live and breathe every day, especially in a post COVID world when everything is online. It is. Everything we do is online and we have to, especially on B2B marketers, we're constantly tied to what are you driving? What's performance? How much revenue are you driving? And it's that connection of different data sources. It's pulling things together and it's knowing what the right things to look at really are. Um, so one thing I, I know about you, Craig, that I think would be really, really interesting for everyone you had talked about when you had left Oracle and a bunch of enterprise software companies to start Keaton. Um, and I initially knew you initially met you when you were CMO at Salesforce and you're running marketing at this super fast growing company and um, you're in tons of different roles. Everyone adores you. You are the person on stage. You're the face of the company outside of Mark. Um, and I know you were faced with a really hard decision. Um, I would love if you can share, you know, what that decision was and what and how you really thought about how you make different uh, different decisions. Yeah, it's a it was it was a really interesting time because I was lucky enough to to sell my first company, Keaton, that we were referencing, the Salesforce kind of Google AdWords magical data connector, to Salesforce in two thousand six. And uh, I thought, actually, I thought I was gonna, just going to be at the company for like a little bit of time and then kind of move on to something else. But the executive team was amazing. Mark was amazing. Parker, his co-founder, was incredible. We were just treated um, perfectly and given all the opportunity in the world and up until the point when, when I was uh, CMO running the marketing department. At that time, Salesforce was, I don't know, maybe 10, uh, uh, growing to 15,000 employees. Um, we really had one core product and we had just launched a second core product. We had the sales cloud, the namesake Salesforce automation system. And we had launched this kind of customer service cloud app, which now is called the service cloud. And it was growing, it was growing really, really, really fast. And it felt like there was a really exciting opportunity there. I had like the dream job at the same time. I had the dream job at the dream company, but I had been there for about seven years and I had this kind of itch to go back and try it again. And of course, as an entrepreneur, you're, when, when, if, if you experience success one time, in the back of your mind, you're always wondering, am I a one hit wonder? Or do I have what it takes to do it again? And that's a big challenge, right? And, and, and most entrepreneurs that experience success, in the back of their mind, they're always kind of scared. They're like, did I get lucky? Or could I do, could I, could I, could I do that again? And I had, you know, so I was watching the Salesforce service cloud kind of surge 
and customers were adopting it. There was a massive shift away from call centers and telephones to everything kind of going online with Twitter and uh, social media and Google and websites and uh, VoIP telephony and like everything was moving to the cloud, right? That's why we called it the service cloud. And one thing that I knew is that Salesforce didn't have a survey tool. And I was excited about this area because I'm personally passionate about customer experience. In fact, customer experience, originally it's kind of started in customer service, but like m most CMOs now actually have customer experience in their job description and kind of own that end to end. Well, I was passionate about customer experience because I was so frustrated with the way companies would treat their customers. And mostly kind of larger companies, imagine, you know, remember the day when you used to call 1-800-C-O-M-P-A-N-Y for help and, and you, you were routed to some call center and the person you were transferred and it was just like, it was a horrible experience trying to get support, but then also companies would deliver a poor customer experience outside of support. Think United Airlines dragging that guy off the airplane, right? And you, you, you can just, so many, so many times when you're engaging with a company in any way, omni-channel, right, in any way, and you didn't have a great experience, how come you can't tell them? How come you can't, you know, not, not to complain, but to try to make their business better? And don't you think the CEO wants to make their business better? Of course, he or she does. And so I was personally passionate about this area, and, and I knew kind of the way to do it was real-time um, feedback gathering from customers, like right in the moment when they have an experience with your company, ask them, how did we do? What can we do better? Like really as simply as that. And Salesforce was not developing this technology because they had so much else on their plate. And so kind of my, again, my co-founder, Sean and I, we were like, who's going to fill this gap? There has to be a really huge gap here if the, if the rise in customer experience is going to happen like we think it is. And so the conundrum that I faced was like, I'm in my dream job as the CMO of Salesforce, but yet I have this desire to start another company and I have a passion in another area. So Lauren, in a nutshell, kind of that was, that, that was the decision that I was staring down in 2012. That's amazing. I mean, so how terrifying was it? Well, it was, it, 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 it was terrifying because, you know, you're, you're, you're in a phenomenal job. And of course, uh, in an industry that's exploding in a company that's exploding and in an executive role, um, uh, where I had a lot of respect at that time. And, uh, and, uh, and so I wasn't being forced out in any way, but I had this desire to leave, uh, to start something new. And I remember Mark at the time said, Hey, Craig, well, what do you want to do at Salesforce? And I said, unfortunately, the only thing I can't do is start a new company. And I have this itch I need to scratch around. Like, am I a one hit wonder? Can I do this again? And I was passionate about this, this specific area. And, um, and, Kind of the funny thing was there were so many companies that were in this space and so that's what was really daunting it wasn't necessarily like leaving and you know setting up you know you know from the towers of salesforce to the living room apartment of my co-founder you know making zero dollars per month like it wasn't it wasn't so much that as it was like wondering like can we succeed and the reason that we were so excited about the opportunity was one thing happened at that time. And that was everybody knew who SurveyMonkey was, right? There were, there were, if you scratch the surface, there were actually 500 companies in the, in the online survey space. And, uh, and, and of course, SurveyMonkey was the household name because it was the freemium product and they had really exploded, but nobody knew how much money SurveyMonkey was making. And SurveyMonkey, uh, which was a private company, they raised um, they raised private equity money, and the valuation of the company kind of came. Their financials kind of came out at that time. And 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 I had a was having a a, a drink with my co-founder Sean, and we're like, wow, this is way bigger than we thought it was going to be. And even though there's 500 companies in the space, nobody is doing it the way that we were thinking about doing. No one was tying it into the enterprise customer service system. So the second that you check out at the Apple store, you get a survey. The second that you walk off of your, your, your Southwest Airlines flight, you have a survey. And guess what? Whenever you walk out of those places, where are you? You're on your phone. So everything, it was built for kind of the desktop. Everything kind of had to be mobile. It had to be real time. It had to be tied into like these kind of corporate systems. Nobody was doing that. And so, 
short term, people thought we were kind of crazy. And so I, I told my mom as a great example. And my mom was like, it sounds like what you're doing is, isn't that like a survey monkey? And by the way, my mom doesn't know what, like a whole bunch of enterprise software technology, but she definitely knew who survey monkey was. And our other advisors were like, Hey guys, you know, I don't, I don't know. And so we started anyway. And to kind of close out on, on kind of how scary it was in this segment, we were connected with, um, at the time, the CEO of survey of survey monkey. And we drove down to Palo Alto and he actually asked for the meeting. We drove down to Palo Alto and, um, we sat in the survey monkey boardroom and the CEO of survey monkey said, we're going to eat your lunch. Everything you just said you're doing, we're going to do that too. Get ready. I'm going to eat your lunch. Well, you know, the, the thought process was, of course, this is a huge market. Everybody's going to buy this. Um, we have the knowledge about how well Salesforce is doing in this area that, 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 that I guess from the outside, you couldn't really see that, but we kind of knew that was happening. And if, and if you just run the projections out a couple of years, you're like, you know, this is going to be a multi-billion dollar business for Salesforce. It actually, I, I don't know what the revenues are now, but it's probably around 5 billion in rev of, of Salesforce's revenue per year. And, and there's this like renaissance and customer experience and, uh, and what we were going to be doing was tied into the kind of the corporate back end, and nobody was doing that and had to look and feel different with mobile and nobody was really doing that. And, um, and so we were like, make the calculated decision, right? That was the data that we had. And the calculated decision was, do we do this or not? And so anybody, again, who's ever been an entrepreneur knows that starting a business is really hard. It's so cool to have a high profile job at a company that everybody knows. It's so not cool uh, to be the founder of a company nobody's ever heard of. And it's so hard, right? Because it's, you have no money and you have no time. It's kind of what Mark Benioff always said when he started Salesforce. I have no money, I have no people and I have no time. And, and so every day you wake up thinking like, how am I going to get to the next milestone? Well, long-term we acquired 10,000 customers and, and our focus was not dominate the world. Our focus was dominate the Salesforce, uh, install base partner with Salesforce. They're kind of the leading, um, emerging technology in this space, in a space where everything is shifting. It's moving to a new paradigm, which is kind of cloud computing versus call centers. And, um, and we just owned our part of the market. We didn't go try to take survey monkeys part of the market. We didn't try to eat their lunch, right? We just went to a space where there was a, a, a lot of green field and we could, we could farm off that land, uh, for a while. And we grew the company steadily. And it was, um, it today, it's kind of the number one feedback platform for Salesforce's service cloud division. But again, we haven't done everything. We competed with huge companies. Qualtrics was our number one competitor. Um, they got taken out by SAP for billions of dollars before their IPO and then spun out. And then we, that they were kind of the, the guys who owned the high end of the market. And then we had research companies like Medallia that we were competing with. And of course we had like the survey monkeys of the world at the low end that we were competing with too. But we, 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 we carved out a space that was unique and differentiated for us. Um, and we sold to the largest kind of companies in the world. The fun, of course, the funny exit is we ended up selling the company to survey monkey in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of amazing where it's, we're, we're going to take, we are going to beat you. We're going to eat your lunch. Actually, you seem to be doing this better than we do. How about we come to a different solution? Yeah. And, and it was a, like, it was, a, it was, it was a great exit. I'm, I'm happy that serving the home for, for that company uh, that I founded. I'm, I'm so happy that the home is at survey monkey. I think that survey monkey is trying to roll up kind of the best of breed uh, and, uh, folks in the space and kind of dominate the, 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 the world of feedback. And, um, it was, it was, it was good for a lot of the employees at our company. And that's kind of when you, when you're an entrepreneur and you start a company and you, you invite these people along for the ride, kind of, you own the health and well being, and you have to think about, you know, this isn't about me anymore. It's about our investors. It's about our employees, like they're number one. No, I love that. And I think there's so many great pieces of, of advice for people listening to this podcast and you leaving leaving a job and deciding to start something on your own is probably one of the hardest decisions anyone can make and leaving something that is amazing and successful. It's, it's a hard decision, but so much of what you said of they go after something you're passionate about, 
find a, a unique space in the market. And even from when you had started, um, you and Sean had started Keaton saying, we had an idea of what this company was. We rolled it out to 10 customers. That was not that was not the solution. And we found a better one. It's such a great, great lessons learned. And now, now you've done it again. You've started another company. And with Qualified and how you're talking about conversational marketing, I think is so interesting and so unique. And it's that same, it seems like that same angle again of what are people doing and what are, what are companies not doing? What are they really missing in the market? And I love how you think about conversational marketing, the company you're building, how you're really pulling data in. Um, can you tell everybody more about it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so my, my current venture, I, I guess by this time, my co-founder Sean and I are, would officially be called serial entrepreneurs. This is the third. This is our third company. It's the biggest. It's the most exciting uh, thing that we've ever worked on. And uh, the 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 market category is called conversational marketing. As you said, that's kind of what people are referring to it as. Um, and our platform that we've built again, it's purpose built for companies that have Salesforce. And so it's 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 weird because it's a it's a marketing play because what it is is basically live chat and chat bots and a lot of kind of sexy technology that allows salespeople to sell on the corporate website. Um, so marketing buys it, but actually sales is sort of the user. So we kind of bridge the gap between, between sales and marketing and it's a massive data play. So really simply kind of, let me tell you the, the backstory of this because you were probably one of these people, Lauren at Salesforce that, that used to tease me. And I was teased for many reasons, but one of the reasons was I would walk around the halls of the spear tower in San Francisco saying I'm blind. And what I was saying was like, I have no idea what's happening with respect to demand gen, like right now. And this would happen because of course, as marketers, we own the lion's share of the pipeline number, uh, the inbound pipeline number. And that would all come through our website, right? Come to our website, fill out a form, run a Super Bowl commercial, come to our website, fill out a form, run a Google ad campaign, come to our website, fill out a form. That was the model, right? And, and, if we weren't hitting our pipeline numbers, boom, the finger pointed on us in marketing and they're like, Hey guys, what's going on? The sales team needs to be fed and you feed them with leads and they come through the website and you own it. What's happening. And that's where I'd say like, I'm blind. I literally have no idea. Can you believe that all of the pipeline that we generated for the sales team, even at a forward thinking company like Salesforce, it, it the vast majority of it came through our website. And as marketers, we literally had no idea who was on our website at any given moment in time. Like we could look at our Google analytics and say like, there's 500 people or 10,000 people on our website, but we had no idea who they were. We didn't know what companies they, they worked with. We had no idea if any of them were like big sales opportunities and our sales team was totally clueless. It's not that they were, the human beings were clueless. It's like nobody had any visibility into the most important marketing asset we had, which is our corporate website still to this day. Uh, you know, I, I preach the most important marketing asset every CMO has is their website. It's, it, it's the face of the company, it's the positioning, and it's the, where the demand comes through. It's the doorway to the, to, you know, to the company. And so when we started Qualified, we were like, how come your website just can't be like, like wicked smart? How come it can't know who's there? How come it can't know what companies they're, they're from? How come you don't know the names of the people? Now, look, uh, of course, this isn't rocket science. It's a, it's a massive integration play. It's a data play. So what we do is we make your website aware of all of your customer-facing systems. So, for example, Pardot or Marketo uh, for marketing automation, Salesforce, which is the core kind of selling database for people, uh, ABM platforms that are tracking segments and intent scoring, uh, data enrichment providers that are like enriching profiles in real time. And then what we do is we light up the website and we say, who is there right now? How many people, how many of them do you know by name? And then we cross-reference that with the data that is largely in Salesforce for, for selling. So for example, we might know, well, hey, Lauren Vaccarello is on our website right now. How do we know that? Because we've cookied you, we've emailed you, you filled out a form. It's like, obviously we, we can know who you are. We should welcome you by name actually. And then we should look inside of our Salesforce database to see what company do you work for? Are you a tier one account? Are you a diamond? Where are you in our ABM segments? Kind of what's your intent score? What's your ideal customer profile score? Do I want, how much do I want to sell to you? Even if you want to buy from me. 
do we have any open opportunities with you? Do we have dead opportunities? Like there's, we just do it all in real time. It's a big data play. And then what we do is we simplify it for the sales team. And we say, if, 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 if the CIO of Walmart and you want to sell to Walmart is on your site, who cares? It's not everybody, but specific people highly, highly care. We have to alert them and we have to tell them and we have to open up a, a magic door on the website for them to talk to you in real time. Don't fill out a form and we'll get back to you later. Don't pick up the phone and call 1-800-C-O-M-P-A-N-Y. Just talk to them right there on the website with chat, with phone calls, with screen sharing, just like you would do on a Zoom. But it's a selling tool. It turns your website into a selling tool and it's a big it's a big data play. It's super exciting. No, that I mean, it is one of the most exciting things that's happening in marketing technology right now. And you 100% hit the nail on the head. It is the it's the power of integrating all of your different systems together and being able to bubble up the important moments that matter. And I look at things like traditional lead scoring. One of the most important factors of getting a lead to an opportunity is how quickly are those leads going to get touched? How can I get this to a salesperson as quickly as possible? And that lead gets touched. And what you're able to do is say, you know what? They don't need to fill out a form. I have all of this data. I'm pulling everything together. The CIO of Walmart's on the website. Instead of me waiting and hoping the CIO may or may not fill out the form, can I just ping the AE? The AE reaches out directly on the website and says, do you want to talk more about this? And we don't have to wait anymore to wait and hope that someone reaches out to us. We can proactively reach out to them. Shorten that time to first touch almost to the negative, because when I think about time to first touch, it's as soon as the form is filled out. So this is negative five minutes before they fill out a form to get the right person talking to them. And it's the it can only increase the likelihood that person is going to be engaged and the deal is actually going to get closed. I, I brought up Walmart. You're, you're spot on. I mean, we call it zero minute response time. But in fact, when you're proactively communicating, it's um, it, 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 you know, one of our customers, is a company called ThoughtSpot, and you actually had the CMO, Scott, on on your show and um, and they sell to Walmart, which is why I kind of brought that up. And uh, and he calls them at bats. Right. When when your target accounts are the people that you really want to sell to who meet your ideal customer profile or they're on your diamond list or whatever you call it at your company, when those people arrive, the, the, the they call them at bats like are you going to step up to the plate and take a swing to try to have a conversation with this individual? Because if you wait, they're going to be gone, right? And they're probably not even going to fill out a form. You won't even know that they were there. So this isn't at bat, like it's an opportunity, which is kind of why we call it a magic door. Like a magic door on the website opens for like for bi-directional communication with chat and voice and all of the good things. Because if you, if they leave, it's a missed opportunity. Completely. And it's the, I've talked to other other marketing leaders and actually people in different industries or in different functions that it's, well, when there's not a lot of scale, maybe you don't need data as much. You know, we only have 50 target accounts. You're not doing the volume. If you're targeting small businesses, there's a ton of volume. You need to run your business based on data to make these decisions. But in this, it's not about how do I sort through tons of data? It is, we know exactly who our customers are. We know all of the right people. We have all of the systems technology in place. Everything is tied together. And you know what? Maybe we only have 50 target accounts, so I don't need to generate 10,000 leads. But if anyone from those 50 target accounts shows up on my front door, I better be able to jump in and respond as quickly as possible. And you don't need 10,000 potential customers. You need to do this with the right customers. And every business has that, but everybody's a little bit unique. You know, at Scott's company, he calls them diamond accounts. And, uh, when, and diamond accounts, by the way, for him are accounts with a billion dollars in revenue or, or north of that. And, but everybody's different, right? Some people only sell in certain geographies. Some people only sell to like mid-market companies in certain industries for Scott, it's diamond accounts. And when a diamond account shows up, it's like roll out the red carpet. This is to, to us, this is a VIP and, it, and, but for every company, what are, who are your VIPs? And when they arrive, what are you going to do about it? And that's kind of the whole idea behind, behind conversational marketing, the, the, the market shift uh, to real time, kind of data driven, personalized engagement. Um, it's kind of the genesis of our entire company. Obviously, you could tell I'm super, super passionate about it. But, you know, to kind of go back to your uh, kind of the theme of your show, which is about hard decisions, 
man, this year has been the most insane year to be part of, uh, to be an entrepreneur. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you can only imagine that what, um, what, I mean, 2020 has just been 2020, I think is now a verb. Um, what, what are some of the hardest decisions you've had to make this year? What are some of the challenges you've had to face? So the biggest one, I think, well, let me, let me kind of state the obvious. Uh, I'll state two obvious things. Number one is as an entrepreneur, you wake up every day and you're faced with really hard decisions because like every, every day is fraught with peril and you're, you're fighting to survive. In fact, there's a really good book um, by, I think it's Ben Horowitz, the hard thing about hard things. And it's about, uh, is your, are you in the, in a, in a, in a wartime or peacetime mindset and is your company in a wartime or peacetime mindset? And when, when you're, when you're an entrepreneur, you are always kind of in this wartime mindset and you're making decisions all the time, like you would be on the battlefield. Right. And every decision has really big consequences. Um, but I'll state the obvious that, you know, COVID was the, was the big decision. And, and so what happened? And what were we trying to decide? Well, our company was on a pretty good trajectory. And we were, or earlier this year, we were kind of seed, we were seed funded, which means you kind of do your first, you're kind of on the venture capital uh, path and you've done kind of your first big raise. And then your job really in a seed stage company is to find uh, this, this elusive product market fit is what people call it. And product market fit just basically says, do you have the product that people will buy? And is that repeatable? Like, have you found, have you found your market and can you repeatably sell your product? And, uh, and is your product, you know, good enough? Does it have all the things that it needs to have in order to repeatably do that? And we had found our product market fit and we were kind of, um, we were super excited about getting to the next round. We had, we had re reached all the milestones that we needed to, to kind of go for our series a and, and we were ramping up in plans for that series a. So January, February, March, we were like higher, higher, higher and, uh, and scale the business, scale the business, scale the business, sign an office lease, you know, that's capable of supporting, you know, 25 more people, which is, was a horrible decision in hindsight. Right. And then all of a sudden, um, March hit, right. And, and nobody knew what was going on. And if you can remember back at that time, I'm sure everybody kind of remembers where they were on or about April 1st of 2020 and nobody was at work and everybody was kind of scrambling to figure out what was going on with their family. Everybody was trying to figure out, do I work at, how do I work at home with my kids running around? And, and, and the most important thing is nobody knew what was, what was going to happen. Is this the end of the world? Am I going to survive? Is my family going to survive? Are my loved ones going to survive? I mean, it was like uh, fro frozen is the best way to describe it. The world just froze. The business world just froze. And so here I am with kind of my core team, my core co-founding team. And we're like, whoa, what do we do? Because we were on this path that in the absence of COVID, we were like, okay, we're three months to, uh, to raising money, fire up the engines. Let's do the road show, get in our car, go down to Sand Hill road, do the whole thing. And then nobody knew what was going to happen. And so all of a sudden it was like, gather as much data as possible. And how do you gather it is you just start talking to people because there is no historical playbook for this. So, um, so we had a couple options on the table. Option one was and we got a lot of advice for option one. Option one was survival mode. And, and it was almost a lot, it, businesses large and small were thinking survival mode, like hunker down, kill the spend, kill the hiring. Even like many companies did layoffs and in, in riffs, right? It's because like, you gotta, you gotta think if this, if, if, if the world is frozen for a year, like how do I survive? So option one was survival mode. Option two, and we got a lot of people saying you should go with option two was like, well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So like, maybe you should just like, maybe raise a little bit of money, hire a couple people, see, just kind of, it was like the wait and see approach, not full lockdown survival mode, but just kind of like, yo, take your foot off the gas. Like, do not be accelerating into this crisis. Take your foot off the gas, pump the brakes a little bit and see what's going on. And then option three uh, was accelerate into the chaos. 
like do the opposite of what felt totally normal, which was like, put your foot on the gas and put the pedal to the floor because so many, why? Because maybe this is an accelerant for your business. Like it is what, well, like it, like it is for zoom, like it is for Slack. Like maybe this is an accelerant for your business and you know, you're not, you don't sell to SMBs and you're not in the door to door advertising game. And like, like you're, you're an enterprise software company that sells to kind of mid market and, and, and larger enterprises, this maybe is an accelerant and maybe you should, maybe you should, you know, put fuel on the fire. And so that's kind of what we did. The other thing we did is we, we, we kind of hopped on zoom and we talked to every venture capitalist who would talk to us, not for asking for money, but asking, what are you seeing right now? What are you doing? What's the market for venture investing right now? Are you guys spend deploying capital? Um, are you, what are you seeing with your peer group? And it was kind of unprecedented. The only thing they had to go back on was the financial crisis in 2008. And they were like, well, here's what we did. We all did back then. But everyone kind of said, I don't know if it's going to be the same this time. And so that was all the data we had to make that, to make the call. We had option one, option two, and option three. So, um, so in April was, um, was completely uncertain. We made plans for all three. And that's really how we spent the month of April uh, was, was making plans for survival mode. Like, what does that mean to our business? What do we do? And then all the way through to, uh, to the end. And then we noticed that in May, we noticed a, a slight uptick in demand, meaning like what we could measure, like what we, we, we could measure the number of sales conversations we were having. We could measure the number of visitors that were coming to our website. Like we froze all of our spend. So all we had to go on was like, what's kind of coming to us and what are we seeing out there? So obviously we're measuring our website. We're measuring our sales conversations. Uh, we're, we're, we're measuring customer interest. Like we had active uh, buying cycle sales opportunities. We're like, are those decelerating or are they, are they still buying? Is anybody even able to buy? Because buying software now meant you have to get approval from your, your CFO. Like the whole buying process changed for, for, for all of us during that time. Slight uptick in May, a bigger uptick uh, at the beginning of June. And we were like, it feels like with all the data points we have, which were not that many, it feels like maybe we should go with option three, accelerate into the chaos. And we ran a full uh, VC evaluation for our Series A. Uh, we ended up closing an amazing deal uh, with Salesforce Ventures, uh, Redpoint Ventures, and Norwest Venture Partners, three super reputable um, venture investors. And uh, then we saw the close of June tick up again. We closed the, the, round, the Series A round on July 24th. We saw July uptick again. And then it was like perfect timing because we, we had just a surge August was our best month in the history of the company. September became our best month in the history of the company. October was our best month in the history of the company. And now November is going to be the best month in the history of our company. And we're going to close this year with our company growing eight, actually 800% uh, year over year. And it's, it was just like, I just always, I, I said through the entire thing, I feel so lucky to be in the software industry right now because so many other industries are you know are in survival mode and luckily we're able to manufacture software with a team of of remote people all over the united states now that's that's incredible i i was really hoping this story would end with with option three and it's it is incredible that you are able to take what is the toughest year full stop for anybody and turn this into such a big success for the for the company. And at the end of the day, a company is made up of a bunch of employees. And to be able to do that with and for all the people that you work uh, that you work with and all the customers you have. Um, and I think you have an announcement about Salesforce that happened recently. Yeah, well, le less of an announcement, and I think just more about you know why has our business thrived in kind of this post COVID era. And it's just because everybody's everybody's digital, right? There are a whole bunch of things marketers can't do anymore. Like right? we can't do physical events, we can't do sponsor trade shows, we can't 
get up on stage and speak and gather audiences. We can't do CIO dinners. We can't do executive briefings, fly people out and do put on a whole you know song and dance. There's a whole bunch of things we can't do anymore. And coupled with the fact that this year, for the most part, a lot of marketers have just kind of had their budgets frozen or even reduced. And so they're thinking about doing more with, le with less. And so if you have to do more with less, the first most obvious thing to think about, if, you, if you're responsible for demand gen and pipeline, by the way, those targets haven't gone down, right? No, I know a lot of sales teams that have gotten quota reduction. I don't know a single marketer that has gotten a, our equivalent of quota reduction saying, okay, deliver me less pipeline. It's Just give me less pipeline. It's, it, it, it hasn't happened, right? So as I think uh, demand gen marketers um, and growth marketers and CMOs right now are, are thinking like, well, look, like, why don't we just capitalize on all this, all, all this traffic that's coming to our website? Like, why don't we just be super smart about it and pick off some of these guys? And like, can we grow? Like, can we, can we like two X or three X our, our pipeline that's driven through kind of this, this, this inbound channel by doing this new thing. And instead of being blind, like I was at Salesforce, instead of being blind, like, why don't we like open our eyes and shine a light on what's going on and try to be super smart about it. And so um, that's, I think that's been the reason kind of the all digital world now that we live in has been the reason that our company succeeded this year. But with respect to Salesforce, um, Salesforce, for those of you who are in the, familiar with Salesforce or in the ecosystem or the Ohana, as they call it, we all used to get a lot of demand by sponsoring those events. Dreamforce, right, would have been going on right about now in downtown San Francisco. Uh, the Salesforce World Tour, we would sponsor the, the New York event and the Atlanta event and the London event. Well, those things aren't happening anymore. And so Salesforce was really in the spirit, uh, in the Ohana spirit. They re were really looking for ways they could help their partners more, especially in this time. And so um, Salesforce reached out to every single partner and said, like, how are you doing? How can we help you? It was really, really cool. And the, the executive sponsor at Salesforce who owns, owns our account is a guy named Woodson Martin. And Woodson is actually kind of the general manager of the App Exchange, which is the Salesforce App Store, among many other things. And when I was having a conversation with Woodson, we kind of hatched this idea of what if we could just turn the Salesforce App Exchange, which is like, you know, it, in, a, in a world where you go to, to Dreamforce and you have the trade show floor of all the vendors, well, the, the, the virtual manifestation of that is the App Exchange. And we kind of hatched this idea of like, what if you could just turn the App Exchange into a place where partners could literally talk to prospective buyers? just like we're enabling companies to do on their, on their, on their, on their own corporate website. What if you could do that on the app exchange, even though that's not your website? So, so if you are the, uh, are the chief marketing officer of, um, of own backup, which is the number one backup and recovery plan, uh, product for Salesforce or financial force or Conga or inside view or ring DNA, like these are all Salesforce partners. What if you could talk to visitors who were, who are searching the app exchange for products like yours as if in the real world, when they cross by your booth at Dreamforce, you could just talk to them. And how many leads can you generate from that? How much more demand could you generate from that? And it became a program uh, that Salesforce uh, has been running uh, called app exchange chat. And it just went live with the first group of kind of the highest end select partners uh, of Salesforce, but the entire, you can see it at app exchange.salesforce.com and kind of qualified as the technology that's powering that. But the vision, of course, is it's it's like everybody that, you know, that app exchange can come to life and it can facilitate conversations between buyers and sellers, just like uh, we would have in previous years at Dreamforce. Super cool idea, super cool program. Thanks to the guys at Salesforce for kind of making it happen. And it's kind of the, one of the most exciting projects I've worked on um, very recently. No, that's awesome. And there's there's so many different applications and if 2020 has taught us anything, it's how do we keep innovating? How do we keep innovating as marketers, as executives, as leaders, as just people of finding new ways and new ways to solve problems? I I feel like I could spend hours talking to you about entrepreneurship, but um, for those of you at home, you don't realize how late it is that Craig and I are recording, and I feel like he probably wants to go to bed soon. But uh, this is my favorite part of every segment, which is the rapid fire questions. Uh, are you ready for rapid fire questions? You did Rap not in advance. I have no idea. Rapid fire. Let's go. Um, 
what is the hobby that you have picked up since uh, March hit this year? <laughs> I have picked up this goofy hobby, um, which I have actually discovered eBay. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I, I the 90s. And I had this original idea that, uh, that I, that I've always, you know, I've always kind of, I've, I played poker a lot. I, I enjoy, um, card games and stuff like that. And I had this original idea of like, you know, what? I, I wish I could, um, I wish I had a poker chip set, but they were actually like real casino chips. And it was just sort of like a, yeah, maybe someday that would be super cool. Well, I discovered eBay basically. And I've <laughs> like, I've kind of learned the entire history of Las Vegas and casinos. And I've just kind of gotten super into like, you know, doing research on like old Las Vegas history, how the town came to be, uh, the rise and fall of these, you know, different operations, casino currency, like why it exists and how they track it and the security measures and all that kind of stuff. It's been a, it's actually been a fun thing. Uh, to jump into something new this year. Really cool. Um, what is your favorite new podcast? Well, um, quick, quick plug, if I may, um, we launched a podcast this year. It was super cool. It's called Demand Gen Visionaries for anybody who's a CMO or a, 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 a data operations person, or if you're responsible for marketing numbers, like it's, it's pretty fascinating. And um, you can find it at at qualify.com slash podcast or demandgenvisionaries.com. And as a, as a, as a marketer, like I'd never had an idea of doing a podcast. Like, I, you know, I'm on shows like this with you, which is super cool. And I was like, well, how, how can you do podcast marketing? Like, what is it? How do you do it? And so, um, we kind of hatched this idea for, uh, to create a podcast that's specific to demand gen professionals and, and marketers, because like, there's not enough praise that can be put on demand gen professionals. You know, when you're, when you're in the trenches and you know, it kind of like you and I used to work together at Salesforce, Lauren, and I'm like, Oh my God, like, do you know what Lauren's team does? Does anybody have any idea? Um, but there hasn't really been a really good forum for demand gen pros to just like share their worst, especially in the post COVID era. Like what are your uncuttable budget items right now? And how's that changed? And like, it's just a community of CMOs and heads of demand gen talking about, um, talking about their strategies and how they're spending money and what they see working. Um, so that's been really fun to basically be the producer of, of a podcast and enter into a kind of a new thing, podcast marketing. Um, and, uh, and I, I always, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a faithful listener of, um, of, of financial podcasts, especially the one that NPR produces. Awesome. Uh, what, um, what is one piece of advice you would give to, uh, an entrepreneur? The, the, the main thing is like, stick with it that, you know, being an entrepreneur is really hard. You wake up some days and you think you're going to conquer the world. And then you literally wake up the next day and you think you're going to go out of business. And it's this roller coaster of emotion. And, uh, if, if, if anybody out there has ever started a company, you know, exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. And it's so weird to think that like, how, how in, in, on one day do I think I'm going to conquer the world? The next day, I think I'm going to go out of business. How's that even possible? Um, but it's just the ups and downs, like our, the, the highs are higher and the lows are lower because you feel every single part of your business. You just have to be super driven. You have to be super excited about what, what you're working on. Even in the lows of the lows, you have to be super excited about it. And uh, it's for that reason, it's not for uh, for everybody, but stick with it. That's my advice. I think that is excellent advice. Craig, thank you so, so, so much for joining us. And uh, I will give an additional plug. If you are in marketing demand, go to market. Demand Gen Visionaries is an awesome podcast. You're right. Demand Gen Marketers don't get enough praise. Hey, Lauren, thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Truth Be Known is brought to you by Talend. A leader in data integration and data integrity, Talend enables every company to find clarity amidst the chaos. Talend Data Fabric brings together in a single platform all the necessary capabilities that ensure enterprise data is complete, clean, compliant, and readily available to everyone who needs it throughout the organization. Learn more at talend.com. That's T-A-L-E-N-D.com.